you've decided to take the plunge and run Dungeons and Dragons because you are, if I may say so, wise and intelligent and possessed of good taste. But you are somewhat intimidated by the sheer depth and breadth of material that is out there and you feel like you'd have to memorize all this stuff. There's an official world, it's called the Forgotten Realms, that has decades of history. And maybe one or two of your players have played D&D before and you're worried that they're going to know more about the world if you use an official world than you do. But that cannot happen if you are using your world. Building your own world from scratch can be an intimidating process. I did a whole series on Twitch, which you can watch. There'll be a link in the doobly-doo called Collaborous, uh, the collaborative world we built together online. But that's a very top-down way of doing it, and I don't think you need to do that. I think all you need to build your own world for Dungeons & Dragons is a town, a local area, and an adventure. You don't need thousands of years of history. You don't need a huge globe or a continent because your players can't get to any of those places right out of the gate. And if you're starting at first level, these are characters that have not experienced the wider world. And if you are someone who grew up in a medieval environment, you probably didn't have a clear understanding of what the world looked like outside of the, you know, 100 or 200 miles around where you grew up. And of course, if this becomes a hobby and you play every week or twice a month or whatever, then you will be adding on to this world over time and you'll be surprised at how quickly you have your own robust, huge campaign setting with lots of maps and cool stuff. This is gonna be a small town. It's not gonna be a big city. Its virtue is not that it is sprawling and has tons of detail. Its virtue is that it's small and the players can explore it in one session and meet a lot of interesting NPCs and that it seems plausible and believable. There are three steps. I often break things into threes, beginning, middle, and end. There are three steps in this process. First, we're gonna make a list of all the shops that we can expect to find in the town. Second, we're gonna name all the NPCs that live there. And then three, we're gonna draw a map. If I'm right, by the time we get to the end of this video, it will seem like actually a pretty straightforward process and not at all intimidating. And you can obviously just use the town that we're about to make up, or hopefully some of you watching this are inspired to do it yourself and make your own town that is yours and belongs to you and that you'll be able to use forever and build on. And when you run D&D for other groups of people, they can start in this town and you'll know it like the back of your hand because it is yours. I think we've had enough of me talking and this, so why don't we go to where the work happens? Transition. But this is Excel. This is where I do quite a lot of my design and writing for D&D because I like having information broken up into cells. But of course, I could just as easily use Microsoft Word. And if you don't have Word or Excel because you'd have to pay for them, I recommend using Google Docs. It's pretty good these days. Uh, we're going to make a list. It's just a list of places in town. Professions, really, I think is a good way of looking at it. Or we could call it shops. The shops is a little bit misleading because not all of these places can you buy things from. So we could call it points of interest or whatever, but it's not that important what we call it. We're just gonna make a list uh, and I just like starting in the middle of the page because it makes it easier for me to read. So what is there in this town? Well, there's certainly an inn. Right. In fact, let's make this uh, look like a header. There we go. Uh, there's certainly an inn. I don't know what the name of the inn is yet. We'll figure that out later. But there should be something in this town, I think, that is the point of interest, the thing that defines this town and makes it different than other towns. I don't think it should be extraordinary or fantastical. That's just down to my taste. You are free to put something crazy in your town. But I like starting towns being plausible and believable because I like meeting normal people and control contrasting the adventurers who are heroes and the crazy stuff that's going to happen, the adventure, with the reactions of the normal people in a town. So I try to keep things grounded. I think, I know it doesn't matter, we're going to have a stables. And this is a big stable. I'm going to make a note here. Big. And this is the thing this town is known for. It's known for the fact that they have several and good horses that people can either buy or, I guess, rent? Question mark. I'm not sure how that would work. If the stables is a big deal, then there's probably a farrier. A uh, farrier is somebody that works on shoeing horses and keeping their hooves uh, clean and healthy and functional because that is super important. So we imagine if there's a stable that there's probably several farms, right? And farmers that need horses to pull things. But I, we're not, farms are outside of the town proper. They are, they're part of what the townspeople consider our town and includes all the farms in the area. But it's not going to be on our map because they're often miles away from the town proper. Um, if there's a farrier, there's probably a tanner because horses die and there's you know everything nothing is is wasted in a medieval society they they use all the parts of the buffalo so to speak or in this case the horse and a tanner is somebody who um you know not to put too fine a point on it boils down 
horse bits and turns them into all sorts of useful things, including leather, by the way. So there's probably a leather worker. And the tanner and the leather worker are probably next to each other. Um, there's probably a blacksmith. Now, in a smaller town, blacksmith. In a smaller town, there probably wouldn't be a blacksmith and a farrier. They'd probably be the same person. But because sort of the whole uh, thing, the zeitgeist of our town is that they have a big stables, this is, in other words, there are enough horses to make it important enough for there to be a farrier and a blacksmith. Let's put a muse in here. A muse, I like the idea that our town has a falconer, and this is where he keeps his falcons. That's actually the name of a place where you keep your you keep your birds. Having a muse in town, I just think is neat, because it's probably not something the players expect, and it's going to give the town a little bit of character. There's also going to be a church, almost certainly, because this is a D&D world, and uh, there's you know we need places for the priests to go worship. There are probably forests nearby, so we're probably going to have a carpenter. And a wheelwright. This is somebody who all they do is they just make they make and repair wheels, which is obviously very important for a town that has trade with anyone anywhere. It's also important for the farmers that live and work nearby because they have carts and the carts stop working if the wheels stop working. Uh, let's have a baker. And if we have a baker, there must be a mill and the mill should be near a river. I'm going to make a little note near the river, which means there's a river. Of course, there's a river. There should be a general store. This is probably the place the players are going to visit first. And this is also a, a trader's post is another way of looking at it. Um, or perhaps even more likely and more accurately, a carter's shop. Because a carter is the person who has a cart and goes from town to town buying the things this town makes, selling them in nearby towns, and using the money to buy the things this town doesn't have, and thereby does trade happen. This is a town in a D&D world, so there should be some fantastical elements to it. We do have the church up here, and this is the church to a D&D deity. So that means the rector or the prior here can actually cast spells called prayers. But it would be nice if there was uh, other alternatives for people that arrive in town and don't want to go straight to the church, like a witch's cottage, maybe. Uh, but actually, I mean, she's maybe a druid. But would they call her a witch? They might, but they might call her a fortune teller. I think that's sort of a more fun way of saying the same thing and this is someone who can also like dispense preventatives and things that are sort of outside the purview of the church and if there's a fortune teller at a church there's probably a wizard's tower that's this 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 may be the thing that dominates the landscape um but i also think of the wizard as being somewhat not entirely unlike the fortune teller that they're both kind of hermits and so even though this might be a, a large tower that dominates the landscape i don't imagine the townsfolk go there very often the wizard kind of the wizard and keeps to himself also people die we got to bury him somewhere so let's put a graveyard in here uh i think graveyards i often don't see graveyards in medieval town maps for dnd I'm, I'm not sure why what else might we throw in here a cobbler we don't want to go overboard we don't want to put literally everything we can think in here but there should be about 20 shops or places of interest there's probably a candle maker they need illumination which they would have called a chandler there are websites you can go to you can just look up medieval occupations and get a a huge list of in some cases really obscure stuff like somebody who dyes things somebody who dyes cloths or a tailor you know there's dozens of different professions that you can choose from to make your town look and feel unique and you know what we're going to do something i haven't done before because usually i have the shire reeve i.e the local constabulary living not in this town somebody who visits town to town but let's put the reeves house in this town and then i think you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. We've got 21 different points of interest in houses in our town. And we're already, you know, we're apart from having to draw it and figure out what the names are, we're almost done. The next step, obviously, is we're going to populate these with names. And that is easy to do, but time consuming. In other words, it doesn't take a lot of work. It doesn't even really take a lot of thought, but you do have to go place by place and decide who works this shop and is it a person or a family and what are the names? In other words, who are the players going to meet if they come to any of these places? So what I do is I use the, uh, it's called Gary Gygax's Extraordinary Book of Names. You can get it on the DMs Guild. I think I'll put a link in the doobly-doo and rather than force you to sit here and watch me pour over that, we're just going to cut to these all being populated. 
After about only an hour, we've got a list of names of the people that run our shops and their families. And I actually expect that I would do a little bit more work and detail this out a little bit more, give descriptions to some of these folks. Uh, all I've done right now is uh, noted whether or not they're male or female. I've also made notes of which ones are old, older. So when they meet them, I can make a little, I can improv a little bit based solely on the fact that Brannock, the blacksmith, is older. That'll help me out when I'm in inventing their character and then also the same thing which are the younger people in town younger than average i should say and then which ones are you know married and what their uh, husband and or wife is named and let's see you know, Honora and Willem and their son Edric run the inn, which I still don't have a name for, but I'll figure out. You know, the farrier Lear is married to Joyce. And some of these people like Brannock, maybe they're married and maybe they have a family. Maybe they just don't live in town. That's always possible. Or maybe they're widowed. And of course, we have here Thomas. The tanner is in a relationship with Terrell the wheelwright. They're both guys because why not? That seems reasonable and plausible given the human experience to me. One thing I would probably do if I were to write this all out, like, for instance, if I were to make it a product, which I don't intend on doing, is I would write little descriptions for each of these people, or I might make my own notes about which actors I imagine would play them or what their accent would be, because these people might, some of them might be from different places or what their ethnicity is, because in my setting, you can be anyone and be from anywhere. But one thing that's missing, actually, is any elves or half-elves or dwarves or halflings, because my setting tends to be about people, but certainly Quick, this is a real name from the real world, but Quick the Cobbler could be a halfling. That wouldn't be a surprise. And there was some name up here I saw, like Lear the Farrier. This is a real name, but this could easily be a half-elf. So in a relatively short period of time, you know, if we woke up one Saturday and decided I wanted to knock this out, I would still not yet be two hours into this process, actually much less. I could probably get all this done in like 90 minutes. And I do spend time looking at different names and trying to pick ones that sound relatable and plausible because you can definitely get into, especially with medieval names, you can get into names that are just you know, hard to pronounce. And obviously the people back then pronounced them easily, but if you can't plausibly pronounce this name, then you're going to have a hard time selling it. So I filter all these names based on stuff that I, as a dungeon master, think that I could pronounce in the moment. Now, the next step is, let's draw the town. White. A blank page or canvas. The challenge to bring order to the whole through design, composition, tension, balance, light, and harmony. This is just Photoshop, by the way. I, in fact, I realize many of you watching are like, well, I don't have Photoshop, that's fine, because if it wasn't for you folks, I wouldn't be using Photoshop. I would be just be doing this on paper or graph paper, but I don't have a really easy way to film that. So here we are in Photoshop, and we've just got a white background. Let me nudge this over a little bit. And uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fill this space with green. So let's grab our paintbrush tool and just go, well, there we go. That is our grassy background. And all we're going to do is we are going to draw the town. And let's see, I think a town needs at least two things to start with. Let's uh, grab a color palette. How do I make, how do I make a, well, let's do, start with a blue color in the first instance. How about that? Will that work? Is that blue enough? I don't know. We're going to find out together. And I guess I need to draw a brush. Uh, oh, look at the Photoshop. That's cool. Photoshop's got this. Uh, or maybe do I want a line? I don't know. I'm not an expert in Photoshop. So here, let's. we can make this bigger, can't we? All right, I've moved the window around a little bit so I can see the brush tools over here. And we're going to draw the first major feature of our town because I think all towns belong on a river. So we are going to draw a river that runs through it. And now one of the nice things about, there we go, done. We've already begun. One of the nice things about campaign cartographer, maybe the only nice thing because it is an incredibly complex and Byzantine and abstruse piece of software is that it does fractal lines natively and you can just click on, I wanna draw a river or I wanna draw a road and it will automatically generate it in a, what is a actually natural manner that gives it a natural, natural bends and curves and those are the fractals, but I don't, I don't know how to do a fractal line in Photoshop. 
Having done a little bit of research to figure out how you do brown in Photoshop, we are now going to make a road. And the road is going to, we don't want it to be exactly like a literally perpendicular to the river. It should still look somewhat natural. So the road is going to come in like this. It's going to cross the river here, and then it's going to start going up that way. Or if you have a road going across a river, that means we need a structure. That structure is called a bridge. Oh, that's too big a bridge. So I, what I did was I grabbed a bunch of graphics. It's a pack you can buy online. I literally only did that for you folks so this would look good. It's the Cityographer icons. There's a whole app, Cityographer, that you can use with it. I'll put a link in the doobly-doo to all these things. And we'll use the Shift key to shrink this down and keep the proportions. And then grab it and move it around. What are the dimensions of the, what's the scale of this town? I have no idea. I have no, oh, what is moving the crosshairs do? Unknown. Let's zoom in a little bit. Grab this, move it over here. Is that too uh, is that too big a bridge for the scale of our city? I think it is. I think it should just be big enough. Uh, there we go. That's fine. So let's move back out. And now, oh, it's too far out. Now we've got a bridge. Let's press return. We have placed our bridge. We have a bridge over our river. I have no idea what the river is called. And the road probably should also have a name. Maybe it's just the road. We've got our first structure. Let's populate our map with all the other cool stuff that's going to be on it. We need a mill, right? Because we have a river, so we're going to drop a mill on here. Oh, it's huge again. Once again, it's very large. So we're just going to take it. We're going to shrink it way down to a reasonable size. And we're going to put it here on the river. And I don't know what that little guideline is doing. Please stop. And let's actually rotate it a little bit. And let's stick it right actually out onto the... Well, there we go. Control lets me put it wherever I want. And now we've got our first building, which is the mill. We said that our city was dominated by a large stable. So let's put, that's too big. Let's put a stables in here. Let's uh, move it around a little bit and we will shrink it down. Once again, holding the shift key. And this stables is going to be right here, right by where the road uh, crosses the river. So it's one of the main pieces of um, one of the big buildings in town. Probably the next one should be an inn. This is a really nice piece of art, this inn here. And let's put the inn opposite the stables. Actually, this is uh, snapping it to every, it looks like 15 degrees. I bet if I hit, oh no, here we get free rotate. And then let's shrink it down and let's drag it over here and make it, uh, it's still a little bit too big. Obviously, these proportions are not going to be super accurate, but it's a big inn. Let's make it a little bit smaller. There we go. So now the inn and the stables are right across from each other, and they are going to be two of the larger buildings in our town. We need a blacksmith shop, so let's grab this guy and drop him in here, and we will put him over here on the other side of town. You can almost imagine that the way the... Uh, the way the river and the road bisect the town creates these four quadrants, and each one would probably be dominated by one or another shop. Is this too big? We can make it smaller. Oh, that's not what we want. We want to constrain the proportions. There we go. That looks like it's a whoop. That looks like it's about right for our purposes. And let's put it a little bit farther out over here. The blacksmith is not as close to the crossroads or where the, or the bridge as everything else. We want a temple, but we don't want a huge, giant cathedral, so let's... Whoa, that's huge, that's big. So let's stick this in here and shrink it down, constraining proportions. Let's spin it around a little bit, and we'll stick it over here. It still needs to be a lot smaller than that. There we go. Now it's now it's one... It's a big... It's probably the only... One of the only stone buildings in town, but now we have a church. In fact, maybe we should uh, rotate it a little bit. Let's make it so it faces more toward the center of town. There we go. We need a tower for our wizard, something that's going to be, I think, far out on the edge. Actually, let's put the tower for the wizard up over here. Whoa, what's that? That's huge. I don't really think this is what our tower looks like, but I think that it can do for the moment. Let's shrink it way down, drag it over here, shrink it down even further. Now, there we go. Nah, there we go. And of course, it's a circle, so it doesn't really have a facing, but we can make it uh, up over here so we don't have to line up too precisely with anything. Now we want somewhere nice for our fortune teller to live, and it would probably be somewhat overgrown at the edge of town. Let's shrink it around. Let's do all the things we need to do to constrain this stuff. Uh, let's put it way over here. Actually, 
put it way up here over in the corner and rotate it so it's facing toward town and shrink it down. This is a relatively small place. There we go. There's our fortune teller's shop. Now we just need a bunch of generic places for our farrier and our tanner and our wheelwright and our baker. So we're just going to drop a bunch of places here on the map. All right, so what I just did before we go too far is I just moved the facings of the buildings so that they're facing toward the road so that people, when they come through town, can see that, oh, look, here's the stables and here's the inn and here is, I don't know whose shop this is, this might be the potter's shop and here is the blacksmith shop. So now we've got enough buildings for all of the shops that we talked about, but you know what we don't have is we don't have any sense of the terrain. So what we want to do is we want to add some contour lines. I think our wizard's tower is probably on a hill, so we're going to draw some contour lines around it. And all this shows us is that our the there's a slope there's a gradient and we will mark these with like 10 foot so it's like every every line represents you're going 10 feet up so now we've shown that there's a gradient it's about a 30 foot tall hill if we imagine each of these lines represents a 10 foot slope so as you go to the north and west of the town you're slowly climbing a hill to get to talk to the wizard one of the things we said we wanted was want a graveyard so let's drop a graveyard in here a little mausoleum and this thing is going to be over here in the corner of the map and in fact I think some of it you're not gonna be able to see all of and you know what if it were up to me our graveyard would probably not be as elaborate as this one but it does the job which is we're just want icons if we were doing this in pencil it would look a lot worse and let's put some contour lines in here to indicate that the graveyard is also on a slight hill, a slight slope moving upward. And that's enough, just 10 feet. And now what we're going to do is we're going to add some trees into here to make it not look so sparse. It's surprising how just dropping down a whole bunch of trees in quasi-random places suddenly makes it look like a town. Now we can label all of these buildings and create a key... And we're done. Look, we made a town. We just dropped in a bunch of numbers. We've got trees and buildings and a river and a road. And actually, this is a perfectly functional starting town. It looks indistinguishable from several other starting towns that I have seen in my career as a DM buying prepackaged adventures. Now, of course, I am very particular about things because I've been running the game for a long time. I would do a lot of stuff like I would change the font here to make it look a little bit more, you know, fantastical, a little bit more like a medieval font or something. And I would want this road and this stream to be fractals to make them look more like natural rivers and streams and i would want lots of footpaths so that you can see how do you get from point a to point b and i would do a little bit of history on the town like for instance this wizard's tower was probably once a guard tower back in some old empire before there was a town back when they just needed a watchtower out in the wilderness and of course that empire has fallen and someone has occupied this tower the wizard and i would make a little bit of effort to make the um scale of the buildings look a little bit more accurate. I scaled up the stables because we wanted the stables to be one of the dominant buildings in town. And of course, according to my legend, which we would have one of, we would list all of the different, we would use the list we already made to populate and say, here's the key to the town so that you know that number one is the inn, number two is the stables, number three is the ferry. Of course, the ferry would be right next to the stables and the tanner is going to be over here on the edge of town because there's a lot of aromas that are generated by tanning and that they're close to the graveyard so that people might smell the wafting the smell of of boiling horse there's no other way to say it and be like ah the dead are rising or something like that they of course it would be in jest but otherwise i feel like we have a perfectly functional town and if not for the fact that i was explaining this as i was doing it, and i was doing it in photoshop would this have taken me two hours i don't think so and now it's my town i know it like the back of my hand i created it and i would spend time fleshing it out and every time i started the game i would start here there we go. You are now well on your way should you follow these steps and make your own town. You would be well on your way to creating your own campaign setting. And we started as small as possible. We started with a little town with a little bit of history to it. We imagined that the Wizard's Tower was once a guard tower. That right out of the gate gives us a little bit of a hook. We imagine it's a town dominated by the stables. It's a place people know they can come and get good horses. And 
at this point, the next step would be to make a local area. In other words, what's out there in the wilderness that there might be to explore? And I think that'll be the next video. And then finally, you would be on the hook to make an adventure. And we already did that in one of the very, very early videos we did, but it was a very short adventure, something you could probably play in one night, frankly. So if we wanted to deploy, you know, a, a little bit more structure and create something that was a little bit more elaborate, we would need something that followed more like a three act structure. And that I think will be the third video in the series. This is probably, we're getting close to one of the last videos that I'll be recording in this space. Oh, people are sad, I know, but I'm taking my games to work slowly, but surely these are some of the last games here at my house. The rest are all at work because that's where we're gonna be playing games in the future and maybe even making videos of us playing games, edited videos. I think watching people play board games, literally just watching people play unedited board games for hours is interminable, but that's where my games are going to live and we're building a multi-camera television studio, so why not show shoot on our set. I think that's super exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. A set that was paid for by you folks, thanks to the Kickstarter. Uh, the product of the Kickstarter is Strongholds and Followers, a fifth edition book that is going to grant you all sorts of new cool stuff, which we're in the middle of testing. Almost done with the manuscript. There's over, I think there's 35 new cool monsters in it and 20 new items, and obviously rules for building strongholds and attracting followers, all of which give your characters new cool abilities. So it's not just you spend your money and you get a big building, you also become a more powerful character as a result because I really want to incentivize people to do it. If you missed the Kickstarter, there is a link to the pre-order in the doobly-doo below. So if you like this content and you want more of it or you want to support any of the stuff that we are doing, I encourage you to pre-order the book. I don't think, I think it's going to be pretty extraordinary. I don't think you'll be disappointed. And for those of you who will be at Gen Con, I and all of MCDM will be at Gen Con. It's going to be a huge adventure. Uh, it's the first time I've been to Gen Con in almost 20, like 2002, I think, was the last time I went. So what is that? 16 years? Quite a long time. And no one else at MCDM has been to Gen Con or indeed many very large gaming conventions as opposed to like video game conventions. So super looking forward to that. Please come find me and say hi. I so so far, my experience meeting followers, fans has been uh, extraordinarily positive. And those of you who are longtime viewers who are still waiting for the next in the politics series, or wouldn't it be nice if Matt continued the uh, building a fighter in every edition of D&D, all of those things will continue. But I'm so swamped right now. I wanted to do some videos just to empower new dungeon masters and make it seem like making a town, making a local area, building an adventure would be relatively easy and straightforward and fun. And so that is this. Until next time, peace out.